With the Advantec subfloor assembly, you can be sure that you're building a reputation on something stronger. And the best builders, well, they may always stand apart, but they never stand alone. So ask yourself, are you bringing your A-game? Okay, for this group of builders roundtable discussion, Sashko was very kind and they're allowing us to use what is kind of their lobby conference room to record. Uh, we were all in, in uh, Denver for the Building Science Symposium. Sashko said, we have a space. So if you hear audio problems with people in the background or manufacturing noises, this is on site. Give us a little credit. We're, we're Give us a little slack, I should say. Uh, we're trying to uh, uh, provide you some content, and we took the opportunity to record here today. So thank you, Sashko, for the space and your support of the podcast. I'm Jake Bruton, and today on the Unbuild It podcast, we have another Builders Roundtable. I'm joined by Luke Mann of Rangeline Homes, Shane Durkin of Company Name I Can Never Remember because your Instagram is not your company name. Patriot High Performance Homes. There we go. And Jackson Andrews from Jackson Andrews Building and Design. Sorry, Shane. I got to make you it's, it's your times, You're so going to have to. Uh, it adds character to me being an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> That's what we're calling Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so today we are going to talk about uh, closing out a project, what it looks like to get to that last few days, what those last few days might look like, and what it looks like after that. And uh, I think we all have fairly similar, but not exactly the same. And I do think that there are some lessons to learn here. And we were just talking, Shane, and uh, I'm going to kick it to you first thing. Like, what does that, what do those last few days look like with you guys? Um, yeah, so full, full disclosure, I don't have it fully figured out. I'm still in the process of learning what works for my business and the type of projects we're on. Same here. And where I started um, was really without a formal punch list project, uh, process at all. And I remember my first project, I completed final building inspection, which in my city is equivalent to certificate of occupancy. Your kind of inspection card serves as your certificate of occupancy and the client's moving truck showed up the next day. Uh, and what should have been kind of an easy punchless pro process just dragged on for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and it became painful for, for both parties. Uh, fast forward to now, you know, I've completed a number of projects since then, I, I've kind of worked out, and, and I think it comes down to expectation management like we talked, Luke. Uh, I have this conversation with clients where I say, you know, final building inspection does not equate to move in. Those two things are not one and the same uh, because there's this punch list process that has to take place in between. And I've actually started to work it and incorporate it into the language of my contracts that from final building inspection, there has to be some allowance. I think right now it's actually seven working days. I might make that 10. 10 business days where I'm allowed and afforded the opportunity to bring trades in as needed to tie up all these loose ends, some of which might be out of our control or subject to, you know, we're, we're awaiting a replacement ceiling fan that wasn't working and things like that. So um, that's in your contract. It's so in my contract now. So you... they know that now that there okay. is an allotted time after final building inspection for punch list and um, move in can't take place in advance of that. Uh, and really the reason for it is a couple things like, one, what should be a simple task can turn into a monumental task when you're having to respect a client's time and space. You know, you can't show up at 7 a.m. because they're feeding their kids breakfast and they're getting ready to go to school and now they've got pets that they're not home and they don't want their dog to get out and the house is clean and well kept and you've got trades that are coming from a dirty job site that are gonna be marching through it. So many more considerations that you have to take into account when that house is occupied, that it's just way easier for both parties involved. They're gonna get frustrated if there's just an exorbitant amount of work taking place after they move in. So that space and time is, is beneficial for both of us. But the other thing is so that I, I've learned that if I don't draw a clear line in the sand and create a punch list that's mutually agreed upon, work our way through it to completion, that when move-in occurs, that you get what I call punch list creep scope creep is, you know, not to say that if they discover things when they move in, uh, it shouldn't be my obligation to fix them because of course things will get missed. And I just kind of shared this analogy with you that 
like what I tell clients is, hey, we've built this one of a kind custom vehicle. I get to start the engine, start the ignition and push all the buttons and make sure things turn on, but I'm not driving it. I'm not taking it on the highway. That's what you're gonna do when you move in and live in it. You're going to discover things, you're going to find things that I'm gonna have to come back and tend to. Um, but if you don't work your way reasonably through you know, a well-construed punch list, oftentimes what happens, and it's happened to me before, is you, you know, clients will move in and they want to con- conduct additional scope of work. You know, hey, we wanna add this, let's add a reverse osmosis here. And when those two things become intertwined and now you're taking on additional scope of work that you're spending time to do that ahead of punch list, Mm -hmm. you know, it becomes really hard to separate, especially if you have like a retention, a fee that's subject, you know, to punch list completion. So I've also found too, that not only do you need the time and space, but you need to be able to like draw a line and say, close out the project so that if additional work does arise, it's not, part of your punch list. It's like, hey, sure. this is clearly different. Yeah. This is billable work. Here's a small kind of service contract to do this at. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, continuing the conversation further, that's, I guess, my punch list process for now. Constantly trying to improve it. I'd be curious to hear what yours are. And I think where we go from here is into the warranty customer service discussion. Like, how do you then set the expectation management for like, what are you responsible for? What are you on the hook for? And what should be kind of a homeowner led maintenance, you know. So so before track. we move to that, Jackson, you and I have very similar yes. uh, company documents. They're not the same. We have different markets, different clients, but they are highly influencing each other. And I know that there's something in both of our, uh, <laughs> that I want you to talk about. Before a contract is signed, our clients and your clients both get a construction expectations document Correct. that outlines, here's our expectations. Here's what it's like to work with us. Here's when's appropriate to call. Uh, this is how often you should expect to get an email from your project manager. All those little things. But it also talks about closeout and final payment. Yeah. And I would like for you to, to, to talk about how we handle that. Um, so how we have it structured in our construction expectations you know, packet there when it comes to final payment is that final payment is not withheld due to you know our completion list or our punch out list. Um, again, we're not turning over a punch out list that's like we still need to finish you know the build out you know it's i mean we're, we're talking these are when we talk about punch out lists i know for all of us these are the we have a little bit of paint touch up here or we're waiting on a light to come in that's been back ordered for six months when it comes in we'll of course come install it you know we will rightfully so we might adjust that final payment we're not going to charge for a light that hasn't come in yet kind yeah, of thing we're waiting on a ten thousand yeah, yeah. dollar tub we're not going to make exactly for exactly that. but we we still are able to bill out to come up to completion what we what we've incurred to that point and it's not being withheld due to the completion list and you know the example that i use which ties into your car analogy, mm-hmm. which mine, so this gets way better now because that is a killer analogy that I love and I'm sure we'll all be implementing moving forward. Um, but I use the analogy with a car of, you know, you just bought a car, you drive it off the dealership. Did you, did the, did you hold back payment from the dealership, you know, when you, when you made it or did you pay in full? And all of my clients will say, we, we paid in full. I said, right, now if, you know, what happens if the air conditioning doesn't work, you know, two days from now or two months from now, what happens, you know, and, and it's where we take it back to get serviced. And I said, do they service it? Yes, they, they service it and it's under warranty. So the same way here, you're gonna, you're, you're moving into this home, you're now taking possession, you know, of it. You are going to pay in full for everything that's been completed to date in it. Um, and you're not gonna, we're not gonna retain based off these little completion list items, you know, because it's just like a car, like we're, we're here, like we're coming back to, to fix it at that point. So that's, we do talk about that early on you know, the, the struggle that, you know, we might, we might have is, you know, how I think uh, for us in this completion list is, um, and, or say close out, close out is a challenging thing. And I think that we probably all experience this um, differently, but it's like, it's, it's, it's a really hard part of the process. Mm-hmm. And so I think how we do it's gonna be interesting, but I don't wanna jump to any quick follow-up question though. How do you determine, are you the one determining the appropriate move-in date? Like, is, or is there any Gosh. kind of standard? <laughs> So, trying to learn here, man. Yeah, so this is where um, you have to be willing to put your foot down. You do, but it doesn't always work. Here, uh, so Phil, yeah, I love that we can just be really honest about this stuff. Like, we've got, we've developed some really great contracts. I'm sure we all have these, you know, documents. Everything looks good on paper. Um, 
it, they're only as good as what you're willing to enforce. And if you all haven't heard it yet, y'all will hear another roundtable discussion about client selection. And I think that we can all probably say, like, I, for me at least, the clients that we're working with, they become like really good friends of mine. And so I've got to be willing to say, like, no, you can't move in yet. Mm -hmm. The reality, to be perfectly honest with you all, we we run into. Hold on. We were, I was on one of Jackson's jobs a few weeks ago while well, the painters, the plumbers, the driveway crew was going in, the garage doors were going in, and they were unpacking furniture. So we all know that it, <laughs> there's an ebb and flow, oh, totally. <laughs> that, that yeah. there were certainly people yeah. there still executing work. Sure. While now, I will, so, so the reality, yes, like it, it's, this is the hardest part of the process, I feel like, is closeout. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we have spent, like, even for example, the job that Jake you know, was on uh, when he was in town a couple weeks ago, I can remember having this amazing, just inspiring talk with our team about like, we're gonna wrap this thing up and like, you know, right after the 4th of July, guys, we're gonna have weeks that we can just kind of walk the job and just test it out and just like enjoy it and hell no. I mean, it was just, it was crazy every single day. And I've never had a job, no matter how many times we try to plan it out of like, we're gonna finish and then we're gonna allow ourselves this many weeks of just low key, just put your booties on and kind of come in and walk and inspect. It's never that case because even if we are done, at least I, I always take on that, that scope creep. And we get way more scope creep during that final last stage than we do any other part of the process. And mainly it's because I think clients are like, they're just seeing things either like, this is our chance to change something. Like I didn't like this color or whatever it is, you know, or can you help hang these things? Or we've got this coming and we need more, you know, storage in the laundry room. Can we help hang this or that? Like, and for us, we always, it's gonna be a yes. Now, what we've learned is, which you were talking about too, is you've gotta have the right expectation. So the job site that Jake was on, it was no surprise to the client. Like, hey, we're, like, we're moving furniture in and we've got all this other stuff going on. It was very well discussed, like, in order to meet the date that you wanna do, this is what this is gonna look like. And then after you're in, this is what's gonna be remaining. Are we okay with that? And this is the parameters we're gonna work within. And these are like, sometimes even additional costs that we could incur because of this. Mm -hmm. So it has to be something that we're not, you know, just blindly going into. Mm -hmm. And um, it's so important to have that conversation with the clients because you can tell them what it's gonna be like, but they don't really know what it's going to be like. Yeah. Like from my experience, you know, you can have that conversation with a client, but then it's like you need to ask again and be like, do you really understand? Yes. Like, it's like, I'm setting this expectation, but I'm gonna ask again and tell you again, because I don't think you really understand what it's gonna be like, you know? and so. Um, meeting those expectations are really difficult, you know? Um, I yeah, laugh because I think like even, you know, in another round table, we're talking about, you know, anyone watching this, like learning from our mistakes and, and being like, hey, like put your foot down and, and don't work with a client, you know, if they're not respecting you, if they're not doing this, and be able to learn to, to walk away from it. Like, and I would love to say like, we put our foot down and this is the date, the house isn't done yet, you can't move in. I've never been able to do that, man. I no, just haven't. Yeah, like, no. th these become like good friends, and, and I'm also, but I, at the same time, I've got to be real with them and let them yeah. know what the expectation yeah. is. And there's sometimes I will say like, this is going to be hell, like if, if you're trying to do this. And mm -hmm. and and at that point, they they've been through the process, and there is that level of trust. They'll say like, all right, like we're gonna we're gonna wait, but we've got to at least deliver stuff. Can we at least do that? And we will always find a solution, mm -hmm. you know. But yeah, because by the time you get to close out from my experience, clients, like, it's an exhausting time. Like, the project's been exhausting. They want to move in. They just want to live in their home so bad. Like, talk about the pre-construction phase and the months leading up to actual construction. They're so happy, and they're like, boy, when is, when, when can we get, you know, so by that time they're there, they're already exhausted. Mm -hmm. And so doing a really good job setting that expectation, I mean, it's, it's a tough spot to be in as a builder, but I mean. More often than not, the last couple months of the project, even though we're not near done, it looks done in their eyes. Yeah. It's like, yeah. we could at least move stuff into this closet. Like it's done. It's like, it's, it's not done yet, you know, but it looks done. So Anything they, you put in that yeah. closet is going to be covered. Yeah, right and, and they right just away. feel, so like what they think is done, it's like they're still like, so, so I think for us sometimes it's like, aren't y'all, like we feel this huge rush at the end. And I think, and I tell clients, like, I just tell them now, like, you're naturally going to do this. Like, even like me, not running every job like I used to, like, and have project managers, I come in, I'm like, oh, yeah, guys, we're like almost there. And they're yeah. like, we're not, we're not yeah. there, you know, right. but it does look that way. So I think trying to, like, coach clients, like, it's going to look done, but trust me, it's not done. Does it, does it feel like, does that statement feel um, close at hand, considering you just moved into a house that wasn't completely <laughs> <laughs> That, uh, 
<laughs> that closeout phase, though, too, I was going to say one thing, is it sets the tone for your, it's almost like no matter how good of a job you've done during construction, that closeout phase can really set the tone for your future relationship with that client. And it's, and you want it to go so well. So um, it's a super important time. Before we move on to like post closeout, your analogy of like, we don't really test the house, we get to test drive it. I was on one of Jackson's job and I was like, man, that is like the coolest bathtub I've ever seen. And he was like, oh yeah, I used it. And I was like, really? And he was like, no, you idiot. <laughs> no, yeah, I didn't yeah. use it. Yeah, I totally thought that. I totally thought that he had to get, like, he said it so quick and so, like, deliberate. I was like, he really took it to a bath. I really that. wanted to. Like, I really, some things, we've, I'm sure we've all installed some things. Yeah. Like, Man, I just really want to try this out. You know? Saunas, spas, yeah. Yeah. all the luxury <laughs> stuff that we don't have in our own homes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, even just, like, checking on a job site at night, right? Like, now all of a sudden, you have people there that are, there at night, the 24 hours a day, yeah. you know, because you're just, you know, primarily there from seven, let's say, till four or five. Yeah, right you know, yeah. you know, I mean, that sun starts to go down at night, things cool off, maybe pop a little bit here and there, and they're getting these noises like you were talking about. Yeah. Um, it's a different place at night, too. Okay, so now the clients live in the house. We're done with punch list. When we started talking about warranty earlier, we all kind of said, like, well, this is what the state requires but that really has no bearing on what we do. <laughs> and not in the way of like the state of California requires you to have a tenure on certain aspects of the house or Missouri has a tenure structural. It's not that we don't stand behind that. It's that we don't look at what the state asks us to do as what's gonna be right for our clients necessarily. Yeah, how well so, will our clients respond to if we said, well, the state requires. Yeah. <laughs> so if you couch everything in, this is what we're required to do. So one of the things is like the the, NAHB has a like, here's what you should give your clients. It's a one year warranty. And I can completely understand a one year warranty from a like, well, you have sprinklers and they go off from three to six o'clock in the morning and you're not out there and they spray the damn house and not the yard because nobody's bothered to adjust them. I can't, my house is not built to take three hours of sprinkler six months out of the year and it's all on one window. You know, like that's not what it's designed for. It's designed for natural conditions, and we don't have control over what's happening in your house after we move in. But I always, I always phrase everything in, like, we warranty stupid. Like, if we did something wrong, we're going to come back and fix it. Like, you paid us to do it the right way. If it was done incorrectly, I will come back and fix it. And so everything in our closeout paperwork, the, the very first page of our closeout paperwork is a thank you letter, but then it's an expectations moving forward letter that says, like, we're here, we're not going anywhere. Yes, on the following pages, there'll be a list of subcontractors that we worked with. We don't give them phone numbers or emails, we just, so you know, if you ever have to have read, replace your HVAC system, this is who it was or whatever. Uh, but it says, absolutely, please phone us first. We have relationships, even if it's somebody else's problem, even if the plumber has a plumbing issue that needs to be taken care of, call us so that we can call them so that we can manage the project for whatever needs to happen. If anything happens, we want to know. Call us. Call us. And it says it in multiple places. Like, please call us first. And I think that that's, like, the key to letting them understand that we're not just, like, we're not just done. Mm -hmm. We're not walking away. Like, you live here. It's your house. But we want to take care of you. Well, it's like the car analogy. I mean, how fast are you driving that car? You know, are you... Are you pushing on the brakes super hard at every stoplight or you know are, when you get maintenance warnings are you changing your oil regularly like are you replacing the windshield fluid you know all that sort of stuff but I guess what do you guys do when that one year warranty is up and you get a phone call from a client of something they see or whatever are you you know are you saying well I'm sorry but our warranty's up now we go through the process of billing an hourly rate because you know it's been 366 days and I'm charging you now what do you guys do when you get a call have you ever had a call after the year. Jackson doesn't. They do a warranty. No, we, we, we just do exactly. things That's right why the they first. don't do a warranty. We don't do a warranty. We do yeah. things right the first time. So. Yeah. Exactly. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not a hard and fast day. Right. Like, yeah, on paper, it, it looks like that so that we're protected in case of the sprinkler has been hitting the window for right. six months. Uh, but it almost never is that. I don't think it's ever been that. Yeah. It's always, what are we going to do that's going to be the right thing for these clients and the right thing for our business? Because we don't want them to be unhappy. Right. And it's not like we're held hostage by their opinion, but we built the house to 
to be it for it to be correct. Like yep. we charged you enough to do it correctly. So we're going to take care of anything that wasn't done correctly. Uh, we have a line item on that first page of our closeout paperwork that says like you have a, you know, it's sometimes it's as little as 1500, sometimes it's as much as five or 6,000. This is a, uh, um, an amount that is held in Aero building and it applies for the next 10 years. Uh, if you have drywall pops or cracks or nail heads, just call. We'll come yeah. back and fix it. We'll repaint yeah. everything. We had one recently that we had a little bitty crack on a ceiling that I think is truss uplift. Uh, that's so minor, you probably could fix it with just a paintbrush. Like yeah. if you heavy coated that with paint, it would probably go away. But we're going to cover everything off. We're going to push everything out of the way. We're going to protect the site and we're going to go in and we're going to remud and then we're going to paint the whole ceiling. And the clients are like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah. Do you have your closeout paperwork? And they're like, yeah. And he like walked into the other room and came back with it. And I was like, well, at least he knew where it was. Yeah. I was like, if you open it to the first page, you have an amount of money that's legit set aside for this. And we're not even going to spend all that money. We know that this might happen. We have expansive soils. This is something that it's not a construction defect. It's not our fault. It's not the drywall guy's fault, most likely. Uh, <laughs> like, maybe how, it is. How do you plan that amount? Is it based on it's the based valuation? off value or, of the home uh, okay. or what I perceive the risk to be? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we have big volume ceilings. We're probably more likely to have something come up. Uh, if we have eight foot ceilings on a ranch, we're probably less likely to have something come up. Okay. Uh, and it's not that I then up their charge amount by that amount. It's not like oh, I hid that three thousand in their bill somewhere. It's, I'm setting that aside and saying, I know that in my warranty budget, I need to hold on to this much for this project. And it's just like, if nothing else, that thank you letter is there to say like, we're here, we're here, we're here, call us. We are already planning that there may be a small issue with something and we wanna come back and fix it. And I think like that, that sets the tone for everything moving forward. If they think that they can call, then they're more likely to call and less likely to be like, well, screw those people. They did something wrong and now they're gone. They've moved on to the next house, mm -hmm. two tail light warranty. I'll play devil's advocate here though, because I think everything you say we're all in agreement with, but how do you, I think there's a fine line between providing that level of customer service and um, effectively being taken advantage of, like that you are somehow a concierge service into perpetuity to be responsible for every, for effectively managing all of yeah. the operations of the home like that's a difficult conversation that i often have to tread into and like you said when you're having it with clients who become really good friends it's difficult i think the best thing sorry go ahead if you had, yeah. having the ability to say well this is something that would be considered outside of the warranty mm -hmm. yeah and just phrasing it like that just and not not simple. apologizing and not being like well you know this really like if it really is something that isn't part of your warranty and isn't part of what you offer being, having the ability to stand up and just go, well, this is something that's outside the warranty uh, for something like this cost associated with probably like, and just being plain and deliberate. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually had, uh, I didn't know this about myself until very recently. Jackson's wife explained to me that I'm very upfront and direct and some people have a hard time with that. And I think that it's <laughs> How did because- How you get this long not knowing this about me? So. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that's fair. <laughs> I told my wife that she had told me that and she was like, yeah. Uh, but like, it works really well in, in, in my in my too. business where I can just go, yeah. no, it's A plus B equals C. Like that's how we Particularly do it. in that situation, I don't think you can mince words. You just have to be direct yeah. about it. Yeah, I think the more indirect you are, the worse it's gonna mm -hmm. get and look yeah. for you. If you yeah. seem wishy washy, it seems like you're trying to squirm out from underneath of it or something. Mm -hmm. I think that uh I think something that goes a long way with especially with warranty. I mean it's I look at warranty items as there's there's craftsman craftsmanship. Like did we do something poorly? You know, and I bet you everyone at this table and most of us probably watching, if we haven't executed something right, own it mm -hmm. and fix it. You know, like there's nothing speaks loud to me more volumes to a client than being like, holy crap, they did something wrong and, they, and, and they're actually standing behind it. And they're sure. going to fix it. Um, it could be a product issue, which product warranty, there, there are two parts to keep in mind. To me, it's what's, what's the manufacturer warranty on that product? Hopefully we've already you know, educated the client on this is the product manufacturer's warranty on it, what's what to expect if there's an issue with it. And that's from like previous discussions during like the pre-con and selection phase. Um, so I think it's the ability to kind of like lean on a manufacturer issue, um, also own your own, but then just you've got to have that discernment. And I think you got to know going in and, you know, and there might be clients that you go in knowing that these people have never 
ever reached out to us. I'm glad they finally did. Like they're way outside their warranty phase, but like at least I know like they need help with something. I'm probably gonna go in there and be like, this is, this is a real cosmetic thing. It's super easy. Like we'll just take care of it, you know? Um, yeah. Or exp you explain to them like this, like we talked about this, like this can happen with this product. Um, it's gonna take about this to repair. We, we you know, it, it could happen again kind of a thing. And just being able to explain them to it, but hopefully it's not the first time they're hearing it. I think that goes, there's a lot of emphasis for us on product education in the beginning, what to expect with what you're picking for your house. So that way when this does come up later, it's like, it's more of a reminder of like, oh yeah, like this, this could happen. We kind of did talk about this, but um, I think you've got to, you've got to just be decisive and, and it could be different, like on different jobs. That's the reality too. You, know, you, you might say like on this job, we're going to easily take care of this, you know, on this one, you know, we definitely, you know, talked about this or it's been a longer duration of time where we knew this was going to kind of come up, you know, a caulk cracking, you know, joint. and then kind of explain this isn't warranty. This is expected, you know? So I had a conversation with a builder the other day uh, that I will uh, provide anonymity. I won't, I think everybody at this table knows this builder. Uh, and uh, I was explaining, I was headed back to do a three month visit after turnover. And it's like, well, we do a three, a six and a year. And we kind of just like, well, I want to check in. I want to see how the building's operated. Uh, I almost always go to the six month visit and go, it's time to change the filters. Have you guys changed them? Oh, what filters? Like it's always, <laughs> <laughs> something where it's like it's a good opportunity for yep. me to educate the clients but it's also a really good opportunity for me to go okay this was a new trim sub what kind of what kind of issues am i seeing here what is what is that trim sub working on now that we could take place like yeah. the, like i'm resurveying so it's as much for me as anybody else uh we certainly explain it to clients that we want to check in we want to make sure everything's okay and the builder that i was talking to was like that's the dumbest thing i've ever heard why would you be like hey we probably screwed some stuff up we need to come back three times to check on it and I'm like, we're seeing things from a completely different perspective. And the, the builder I was talking to was like, everything is done at punch list. If it happens after punch list, it's, that's there. They did that to the building. And it's just a completely different view on the customer service side of things. And I'm not sure that that builder's wrong. I just disagree with doing it yeah, that way. Actually, no. mm -hmm. Yeah. He's like, why would you give them the opportunity to sit around and wait for the three month visit and be like, here's the list of things that we're not happy with. I'm like, why wouldn't you want to fix anything that they're not happy with if it's a legitimate complaint? And so I think it's kind of two different perspectives on how to look at it. But I certainly think my perspective works better for yeah. me and my clients. The I would rather know if you're unhappy about something so I can make sure you're not going to be unhappy about that mm -hmm. thing. It's also preventative, too. Like you said, the yeah. filter thing. like Or like, like, hey, don't forget, like you might need to be winterizing hose bibs in a couple months or like are you doing some of these things coming up the, the, the other the, the alternative, door to your crawl space closed yeah the alternative is going to be <laughs> you. the alternative to this is going to be <laughs> <laughs> there was a deliberate pause there <laughs> the alternative is getting a call later being like hey like our water heater isn't working or the ac's down like we'll have you change the filters mm -hmm. what filter like so the, like, you're you're then going to fix a prop now it's a problem that you're having to educate someone like, hey, you haven't maintained this. Like, so this is still, this is your fault, but they might be like, we didn't know. And most of the time, I'm sure, let's assume all of us did take the time to educate our clients on what the maintenance and the care of their home is moving forward and what to do. Like, you know, I'm sure we all provide documentation for that. The reality is, is they still aren't, you know, like, or it's not getting done as often as it should. You know, how many times do you have a, a car and the check in or the, the change oil uh, you know, light comes on and then you're like, I'll get to that next week. And you just kind of hit it, but at least it keeps popping up every week. Not every home has that, has an, has an indicator of someone saying, change your filter, like change your filter. You know to change your filter when all of a sudden your AC is down right. and you're wondering why. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, the way also that you talk about it is just maintaining that relationship with your client as well. I mean, not that your motivation is to get more business from your clients, but it's like how you think that other builder, that client of theirs, if you say no, and I'm a hard no, I'm not coming back, they're never gonna recommend you again. Like, yeah. it just seems like a ignorant way to proceed with your clients. And also, if you see something in the house that you see, you know, that is either incorrect or wrong or something's happening and you bring it up to the client, personally, I'd much rather find that, bring it to the client and say, hey, now here's our next step. We're gonna, we're gonna coordinate this, we're gonna fix it, versus them coming around and seeing something and then telling you and then, you know, I think, from a customer's perspective, I'd much rather have, you know, the way in which I would feel the mo that yeah. we do it. Yeah. yeah. I had a client reach out two weeks ago. We have a little crack on our drywall 
uh, on the ceiling in the dining room. Sure. Uh, what do we do about that? And I was like, well, I need to come by and take a look at it and see what's going on. Like, we certainly want to fix it. When can I get by? And they were like, we're going on vacation. And I was like, time. okay. That's the best time. When are yeah. you leaving? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, for most people, they don't yeah. really, I mean, the, the drywall crack is one thing, but like, we'll do it while you're gone. Just tell us, even if you're going on vacation yeah. in two months, we'll plan it around that. I heard you say something earlier. I want to maybe try and expand upon a little bit. I imagine we share similar thoughts, but I think of, and we were talking about state required warranty, right? Yeah. I think of that only because, to kind of expand upon the car analogy, like that is my legal requirement, like, and that's kind of effectively how I determine the amount of profit I should be earning mm -hmm. on that project, right? So if I've built this house that is, you know, worth millions of dollars and I'm legally obligated to warranty construction defects for a period of 10 years, I think of it as like, man, I have skin in the game for that amount of time. This product is kind of on my hands for that amount of time. What is the appropriate amount that you should charge yeah. to basically bear that burden? And yeah, they're paying for your warranty. 100%, but it's being kind of effectively dictated to us by a state law, essentially. And I think of it the same way as like, if you're gonna buy a car, you know, that might come with a, a certain warranty. Mm -hmm. But you can effectively pay for an extended warranty. Yeah. If you want the manufacturer of the car to say, hey, we will have skin in the game and backstop our product for an additional three years, yeah. well, here's how much that costs. Yep. And you kind of mentioned it too, that like your the size of your warranty expense or fee or whatever you want to call it is dictated by size and scope of mm -hmm. the project. I think about it in a similar way. It's like when I'm pricing a project, here's my kind of overhead expense to basically break even now let's take a look at how much did this house cost? What are the risk factors present that I have to warranty for 10 years? What's a fair amount of profit to earn for that? Yeah. Is effectively kind of the reason why I think of that like state level warranty. It's because if you're kind of having to stand in front of a judge at some point, I mean, the customer service side of it and everything, um, I, I think is almost like a, a separate matter, but it comes down to you know, at some point you might having, you might be getting called forth to warranty an issue that might occur eight years down the road for circumstances outside uh, of your control, control, even though you've tried to build it to the highest degree possible, you know? I think, um, I think um, one of the things that I would leave listeners with uh, from a like viewer, from a customer standpoint, if you're the customer, is um, your attitude, your kindness, mm -hmm. your respect for the entire process extends that warranty without anything being in writing too. Mm -hmm. we, we hate to admit that, mm -hmm. yeah. but if you're one of my favorite people in the world, I'm going to come back and be happy to see you or the people that have a drywall crack on their ceiling. We haven't been back yet, but fingers crossed there's cookies because she always makes cookies <laughs> for us. Like you're going to get better treatment if you're a good person sure. and it's, it's not that you're not going to be treated fairly if you're a garbage human being, but you're not going to get the same level of service. And it, we, we have a hard time as business people putting that out there sometimes because nobody wants to admit that they're treating one client different than mm -hmm. the other. Mm -hmm. But it's like everybody gets a good amount of service and then you get the over and above if everybody likes seeing you. Mm -hmm. It's just human nature. Someone, yeah, totally. someone like I don't know who said it, but I've heard the term used before. It's like you build this emotional bank account. Like, so oh, when you're, yeah. when you're basically performing that level of service and offering that amount of like kindness and respect, you're building this emotional bank account with the client so that God forbid something does go wrong, yeah. you're more likely to be able to resolve that situation in a more like appropriate manner. Yeah. You have a larger that makes amount sense. to draw upon. Yeah. yeah. Effectively. Yeah. 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 I like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for watching the Unbuild It podcast today. We have more of the Builder Roundtable with these guys. They're very gracious with their time to come and join me for this conversation. Make sure you subscribe on the YouTube channel. Make sure that you uh, subscribe on whatever platform you listen to podcasts. And until next time, have a good day.